Welcome to Startup Health TV, I'm Logan Plaster. Today on the show, I'll be talking to Kevin Dedner, CEO and founder of Hurdle, about why we need mental health services like counseling and teletherapy that are culturally competent and designed for communities of color. Now, before we get into that, a quick word about this show, in case you're new around here. At Startup Health, we believe in broadcasting the stories of health moonshot progress, the stories of the most forward-thinking entrepreneurs in health. If you want more of this good news about healthcare's problem solvers, make sure that you subscribe to our channel, hit that notification button, and follow us on social media at Startup Health. Now, back to Kevin Dendner, this guy. So Kevin, even before Hurdle, had a passion born out of his own personal experience to make sure that black men got the mental health services that they needed, that they were lacking in their communities. Then 2020 happened, and the racial reckoning that was sparked by George Floyd's death shined a spotlight on the collective trauma being experienced by the black community and communities on the margin. The time was right for mental health services, a mental health platform that was culturally competent, something that Kevin describes as culturally humble. We'll get into all that in the, in the interview as well as news of Hurdle's recent fundraise. Stick around. Kevin Dedner, CEO and founder of Hurdle. Thank you so much for joining me for this interview. I'm glad to be here, Logan. It's good to see you again. Um, I want to go straight to your website because uh, you've got some really great content. And I know you put a lot of thought into every word that you've used there uh, in order to understand what you're building at Hurdle. You say, uh, quote, mental health care was not designed for everyone. Existing care ignores culture. You've written quite eloquently about your own journey and your own struggle. So I know this is personal to you. So uh, when did that particular issue become apparent to you? Yeah, first of all, Logan, let me just uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to visit with you and to be a part of this series. And, and to like all of our friends at Startup Health, I want to say um, thank you. Our company would not be where it is today without um, the vote of confidence that Startup Health gave us very early in our journey. And Logan, as you recall, when we started the company years ago, um, we started very focused on super serving African-American men. And, um, you know, my background is in public health. And, you know, the conclusion that I had come to professionally was that unmanaged stress and untreated mental health issues were drivers for the low life expectancy of black men. And this is prior to me even experiencing depression myself. And so in that professional space, I was really coming to this understanding and clarity that um, mental health needed to be framed as a public health issue. And, you know, after my own depression and struggling to find um, a therapist who I could establish a connection with you know, what, what I now know as a therapeutic alliance, some people call it a provider fit. Um, I really began to, to really not only see mental health as like this public health issue, but really understand that the, the mental health system um, in our country is, is, is like many other systems, like the housing, the transportation system, meaning it's sort of ripe with injustice and, you know, um, a thinking and a, a, a theory that is sort of not rooted in, in recognizing everyone's humanity. And so, you know, when we say that statement, Logan, really what we're, we're, you know, sort of being, you know, brutally honest about is the mental health care system that we have in this country was designed for middle-class white families. Um, the research that we base our clinical theories on was performed on white families who've experienced one trauma. And so when you think of the experiences of people of color or even people who are um, from marginalized communities, uh, underserved communities in this country, we know at face value that that framework is problematic. And certainly in times like these, 
and sort of as we're starting to see the light to the end of the pandemic and after the social unrest that followed last year following the death of George Floyd, um, you know, not being honest about these realities um, can have dangerous consequences. Speaking about kind of framing up the scope of the problem, uh, how would you sort of talk about really the, the, the nitty gritty downstream effects of not having a mental health system for uh, communities of color and marginalized communities? Like what are just some of the, the effects of that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And, you know, I remind my team all the time that first and foremost, I am trained to think about this in a public health framework. So, you know, in public health, we consider the father of public health to be a fellow by the name of John Snow. Uh, and the story is that he traced down uh, this cause of people getting sick through a water uh, distribution system. And, you know, for, for people of color, you know, when we start to look at these sort of downstream health issues, issues that I believe payers and, you know, employers who pay attention to their data have always been aware of, um, you know, I think we can start to draw, the, we can start to draw the correlation between um, unmanaged stress, untreated mental health issues, like the sociological pressures that people are experiencing daily and how that negatively impacts their, their health. You know, we know for a fact that African-Americans are 20% more likely to experience mental health issues in this country. And, you know, what I argue is that much of that is rooted in the sociological experiences that they're having. And so how does that play out? That plays out in the low life expectancy of black men, it plays out in a, a disproportionate disease burden, it plays out in, in black women and infant mortality. So, you know, us beginning to, you know, have this recognition that, you know, people are having different experiences in this country on a daily basis and, you know, stress in itself. I, I used to say this a lot and I haven't said it in a while, so I'll say it again. Stress in itself can be a good thing, but prolonged stress um, starts to negatively affect our bodies and, and impact our health. And certainly that's the case for people of color. It begins to help us to understand a lot of these disparities. Um, and, and, and of course, I don't want to take away Logan from the systemic things that, you know, sort of also contribute to this. But I do believe that learning to helping people manage the pressures that they experience on a daily basis can significantly improve health outcomes. Okay, so we've sort of framed up some of the issues that sparked uh, you to found Hurdle. This is a good sort of segue to really unpack, go under the hood of what you've built. I know the, the platform I'm sure has evolved some in the last year or two, uh, and I, you're at a really pivotal moment here because you just completed a, a $5 million raise. So uh, why don't you go ahead and really break it down for me. What is Hurdle uh, and what are you building currently? Yeah, I will tell you, Logan, it's interesting. You know, I think oftentimes we hear about how founders should be um, flexible with their ideas and the ideas evolve and so forth. Um, and, and to be really honest, like I'm not involved in my idea much. I've been pretty stubborn about our solution. And so while we narrowly started focused on black men, our offering was always designed um, for, for everyone. Um, you know, we, we train the most, there, there are two significant things that we do differently here than what we see in the market space. Number one, with this recognition that the mental health care system was not designed for everyone, which really what we're talking about is the professional training that our therapists undergo, that they, they're not equipped with the skills and the techniques to you know, take care of patients from diverse backgrounds, people who may not have, who, who you know, they may not share common experiences with. So the first thing that we do that's very different is we train our therapists in an evidence-based technique that helps them develop more cultural responsiveness and cultural humility. And that's significant because, 
we know that 50% of African Americans, for example, terminate therapy prematurely because of the lack of therapeutic alliance, provider fit. Um, that number is pretty high, by the way, for the general population. The number is 33% for the general population. And so that technique is not just a technique for Black folk. Um, it's a technique for people, for our therapists to be able to, you know, take care of a Logan Plaster. Um, just like they could take care of a Kevin Detner. So that's the, the very first significant thing we do. And, and that's important, Logan, because in our industry, um, you will hear a lot about um, matching. And, 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 and so this idea of matching is pretty popular right now. And, and I think matching is certainly a step in the right direction, but I think it's very problematic because matching makes some assumptions that because you know, people look alike or share some commonalities that there's gonna be a stronger therapeutic alliance. And in, in, in some cases that may very well be true, but that is really a dangerous idea um, to, to sort of make a bet on alone. And so I believe that what we do in training our therapists in this technique is superior to matching alone. Um, and and you know, I think that that's gonna be a game changer in this industry. We're already seeing in our early data that we're able to retain people in therapy um, two to three times above the national average. And when I say that, I should be really careful to say that that doesn't mean that we're exploiting people, trying to keep them in therapy much longer for the sake of keeping them in therapy. But what this is about is making sure that people can meet their um, the, their clinical milestones or meet the goals or the objectives of their care plan. So that's a very significant thing. And at the end of the day, for payers and employers that, I mean, their savings, the return on that investment is gonna be super significant. The other thing that we do differently um, is the vertical integration of self-care with access to teletherapy. So we've started to see some shifts in the industry where, um, teletherapy companies are now partnering with meditation apps um, to make their offering comprehensive. That's always been my vision, was to make sure that those two things were connected. And, and mostly because um, we know that talk therapy in itself may be a one-time event uh, every other week. And so what does that patient do in between care? How do they manage their mental health in between care? And so we've always, you know, saw ourselves um, having a comprehensive offering that, you know, there, it was a sort of spectrum of daily motivational messages, which by the way, are also culturally competent with access to um, meditations. On the, the, the other thing I would just mention, the last piece of our offering that I should just mention, you know, we, we started our business with a B2C model and now we've sort of migrated to a B2B selling directly to employees and payers. And also at the corporate level, we're also doing wellness workshops that we you know, can deliver across state lines to corporations. Many employers and payers are coming to this understanding that they need to do a better job of sort of creating the culture internally that they wanna create. You mentioned a minute ago, this idea of um, evidence-based evidence methods of cultural humility. And that caught my attention because in healthcare, we don't always talk about codifying and proving empirically the value of virtues like humility. Um, and so I, I was wondering if you could kind of break down the importance of, uh, of having that evidence-based approach, the data to support that humility versus just the idea that this is just the right thing to do. Um, this, you could come up with a program, you could say cultural humility, we need this, let's do it. Uh, and you're saying, here's an evidence-based approach, here's the data that shows that this works. I think that's an excellent question, Logan, because as I was alluding to earlier, that there is this um, trend happening in the market now. Uh, a couple of things I mentioned before I answer your question. Number one, um, African Americans happen to be the group with the largest increase in treatment seeking behavior. Um, I think that that's a really important um, fact to share because what we have been told 
is that Black people were not in, interested in teletherapy because of cultural and religious beliefs, you know, um, and, you know, the pandemic and the death of George Floyd has really, I think, pushed things to a point that um, people are understanding the importance of their mental health. Um, so I think that the entire industry is aware of that fact. And what many companies seem to be doing now is like sort of, you know, saying, okay, we're, we're, we're gonna serve everyone, but they're not changing their approach and they're not, you know, infusing some evidence strategy. And so, you know, serving black people or people of color, members of the LGBTQ community, it's not as simple as hiring professional models, right? Um, you know, what, what we do in, in training our therapists in this technique um, is, is, is like, is majorly important right now. Um, even, you know, I, I haven't checked this data recently, but a couple months ago, the CDC was reporting that from a survey that 40% of African-Americans were reporting a clinical diagnosable condition. So if you have like teletherapy companies who are simply just doing what they've always done, but now they're advertising to black folk, but they've not sort of taken a step back and thought about their approach to care and how they're equipping therapists. I, you know, I just think that that's so problematic. And, you know, for us, you know, obviously, when you know the story of our company, you know where we started. Um, you know that uh, you know we did an ad a couple months ago, a video we entitled the, the video "True to This." I mean, and, and that's that's essentially what we are. Like we've always been here. It's, it's in our in our it's in our DNA. It is a moral compass for us as a company, uh, and we don't have to reinvent ourselves to meet the the market need right now. I mean, what I hear you saying is that the mental health industry is just the beginning. I mean, once you sort of open up the box of culturally appropriate uh, training for healthcare providers, we're talking about the need is is vast across the healthcare landscape. Is that right? Yeah. So, Logan, you know, this this even before the pandemic, before the social, the racial reckoning that we've sort of been undergoing the last year. This was a $200 billion market. And if it's true that, you know, African-Americans were not really accessing the services, and we do know that to be true, you, you start to understand that this is a market that is sort of really gonna be changing over the next couple of months. And uh, I think that, you know, I'm proud rather that our company stands ready to meet the um, to really, you know, push um, the system to be a system that works for everyone. Yeah. And, you know, you can't fix a problem if you don't call it a problem, if you don't call it out. So like, it, you know, in our company, you know, we're brutally honest about, you know, sort of this historical foundation that we're working on top of. Yeah. You know, we're working on top of a system that, uh, you know, Early on, people did not think that African Americans were good candidates for teletherapy, for talk therapy. They didn't think we had the cognitive ability to relate. Or even the fact that, and this will really blow your mind, that there was actually a diagnosable condition for those who were enslaved who tried to run away. So you, we're dealing with a system yeah. that is, um, you know, like we're sort of trying to unravel these relics to make it be a system that works for everyone. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue to sort of talk about the vision for the future. You know, you've uh, finished this $5 million seed round raise, which really, um, I mean, I'm assuming is a spark to, to grow, to expand, to scale. So I want to know what is this raise going to enable you to do and I mean, sort of subsequently, what's your vision for 2021? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, the, the conversation we were just having makes me feel like I was in the classroom sort of being professorial about laying the foundation about why we have to do the things that we have to do. 
And the second part of the conversation is like what we're building and why I'm excited about it. And, you know, that's the, I mean, I, I am really excited about what the future looks like. I am incredibly optimistic that we as a company have an opportunity to play a part in shifting this, this conversation around mental health and making sure that everyone can have access. I'm really pleased that the, the incoming Surgeon General has also said that mental health will be a priority of his. So I think that, you know, we're, you know, sort of gonna see this national conversation around mental health unfold over the next couple of years. And I'm excited that our company will be a part of that. We started providing services here in DC, Maryland and Virginia. You know, this year will sort of be about laying the foundation to scale the company. We will enter at least um, three to four states this year. Um, we're, you know, building out our platform, making key hires. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we've shifted our business model, selling directly to payers and employers. And we, we, we hope to be able to announce, you know, our first pioneering partnerships in the next couple of, of weeks, maybe a couple of months, I'm not sure. But it's a super exciting time when we think about how do we lay the foundation for expansion to make our services nationwide. You know, what I can tell you, we'll always leave the door open for consumers to purchase directly with us. But, you know, to make our offering uh, more accessible, working with payers and employers is a must for us. And, you know, one of the things I just also mentioned, Logan, when I'm incredibly proud of that most of our, the, the biggest source of clients for us right now in, in our B2C channel happens to be direct referrals, meaning people who, you know, have been in therapy with us and have found value and recommended it to a friend or loved one. And there is no better vote of confidence than people recommending their friends. I love it. Who is a dream partner for you in 2021? Oh, man. You know, listen, we're talking to um, major employers, major payers. And, you know, this, this is all about partnership. Number one, the, the, the ideal partner has this recognition that we need to rethink the system, mm. you know, and that we need to create a new offering. Now, we, we're not selling our offering in a way that we're suggesting that an employer or a payer replace their current offering. But we see our offering as an offering to complement an offering. Okay. And, you know, I, I think that making sure that all your members and all your employees can access the services that they need that they need is, is really the type of partners who we're looking for people who, who you know, the, the type of the companies who may, we're coming up on the anniversary, the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death. And as you know, last year, many companies made public statements, made financial commitments. They talked about, you know, the things that they were gonna do differently internally. And, you know, what we're saying to those companies, like, we're your ideal partner. You know, you really want to have a systemic impact. You want to change, um, you know, the way that you do business. Here's a way for you to cement your commitment by working with a company like ours. Hmm. It's fascinating. Okay. So give them an opportunity to really move from that commitment to tangible action. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely, Logan. I think that you know, I'm, I'm actually, I've been pinning a piece, as you, you allude, I, I, I write a lot and I do it because it's therapeutic. People say to me like, well, how do you have time to do that? I'm like, you know, writing for me is like, a, it's, it's I, therapy. <laughs> I, tell, I tell people that all the time. I say, write, yeah. even if you don't ever publish it or share it, write in order to understand what you're thinking and feeling. Absolutely. And so I've been I've been pinning a piece about um, the death of George Floyd and looking back at this year. And uh, I really believe that that's where we are now, that it's time to make our commitments tangible. 
I think that that's, you know, that's the conversation that we want to have with employers and payers. Here is the opportunity to make your commitment tangible. Mm. Well, that's a beautiful note to, to end on there, Kevin. Uh, it is a pleasure to hear what you're building now, even more to have watched some of your journey over the last three years. And uh, I couldn't be more excited about where Hurdle is heading in 2021. So I appreciate you taking the time with me this morning. Yeah, well, Logan, I'll, I'll end where we started just saying thank you for all of the support and uh, for the friendship that you, the friend that you've been to Hurdle over the last couple of years. Well, appreciate that. Be well, Kevin. Take care. Okay, thanks.